I was asked, uh, could I talk about the five most important things about anatomy that everybody should know? And I thought, well, let's see. I have a PhD in anatomy. It's all important. I mean, really? Five? And I thought, okay, maybe one thing, you know. And then, nah, that's not going to work. So how about, you know, maybe instead of doing that, I think about what kinds of questions do people most often ask me? So that's kind of the direction that I've taken with this talk here. My main job is teaching AMP at Carroll College, and one of the things that I do on the side, meaning another, you know, 40 hours a week or what have you, is that I write anatomy textbooks and for McGraw-Hill education, and these are used all over the country. So um, this is a fun job, but it's also a big job. And when I tell people about this, usually their first reaction is, well, why are you writing a textbook about anatomy? I mean, isn't it all the same? Don't we know everything there is? No? Why do you need a new textbook? You know? And it's a very good point. You know, I mean, I watch old movies. I really like old movies. You look at the oldest ones, the first ones with sound and everything. You look at the people in them, and they got arms, legs, you know, noses. They all look like us, right? So this is true. But, and our understanding did change for quite a while, but for a long time, it has not changed. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute, though, that some things have changed. But you know, aside from the book itself, what has really changed are our students and the way that they learn. And so we adapt our teaching materials and our methods so that they match the way that our students learn. And if you just think about you know, the accessibility of the internet and uh, digital materials, I mean, students can look at an atlas on an iPhone now and study anatomy. So uh, that's a big deal in terms of things um, changing. It's the, the learners, not so much um, the material. Also, so this is kind of like you know, the question, like, aren't we all the same? And, Another thing that we talk about a lot is what we might refer to, sometimes people say normal anatomy, you know, what is, uh, and we refrain from the term normal, because who knows what's normal, right? We, we kind of say expected. Uh, but, you know, a normal anatomy, or normal uh, human being, I should say, in an um, anatomy textbook is male, is about 5 foot 9, and about 165 pounds. So, raise your hand if that's you. So, okay, so we got a lot of abnormal people here, right? <laughs> so that's why we don't like the word normal. What we like to use instead is the word expected. You know, this is the expected anatomy. So in the textbook, yeah, we put in what's normal. So your students are going to learn what is normal or expected anatomy. And here we're looking at muscles of the leg, and a big, big muscle in the back of your calf here has been kind of cut away there. And... Uh, there's a tiny little muscle with this big tendon, this beautiful tendon. It kind of looks like ribbon that you used to wrap paper with. I know I'm giving you some good, some good visuals today, right? Um, but this, is often, this tendon is often used as a graft. So if you, say, mangle up your hands and you need a new tendon for, to rebuild your fingers, they're often going to look for this muscle, and they're going to take that tendon and use it to graft. Well, if you look at this, it's absent in... 7% of the population. I mean, there's a, did you know that not everybody has all the same anatomy? <laughs> Even when it comes to what we consider expected anatomy? And so uh, you kind of need to know first, if you're going to do that, uh, you know, transplant, that this person actually has this plantaris muscle and a plantaris tendon. Uh, similarly, we have, uh, here, these are the uh, forearms, are a couple of my students that we just took this picture last semester. But there's another muscle in your forearm here. And you can actually test to see if you have it. It's called the palmaris longus, because it's very long, and it goes into the palm. And if you take your uh, thumb and your pinky finger, and you put them together, extend the rest of your fingers, and then just slightly bend at the wrist, there's a little tendon there that will just kind of pop up if you have it there. And how many people, if you do it right, sometimes it takes a little bit. Anybody not have it? So there's one over there. Okay. Uh, we found in our classes that, you know, well, so it's absent on average about 11% of the population. In our classes, it's almost 20%. And we happen to have a human cadaver that we use for uh, teaching, and our, and our students call him Al. That's their affectionate name for him. He has it on one side and not the other. So uh, it was pretty interesting stuff. And uh, really what, we're, uh, what I'm really interested in, especially in teaching, is teaching students to expect the unexpected. 
uh, that your book tells you one thing, but don't believe everything you read in there, <laughs> which they really love to hear after they spent $200 on it or something like that, you know? <laughs> so another question I get a lot is, well, what, is, what else is there to learn about anatomy? So you know there's, there's certain percentages of things that are expected and not expected, but there's nothing new to learn. And uh, that would be wrong. <laughs> and ironically, uh, what I uh, put up here on the board is a study that was just done and just uh, published last year, 2015. And it was a study of the lymphatic system. Uh, the lymphatic system isn't actually green, but we color it green in textbooks because you wouldn't be able to see it any other way. But here, uh, all these little green vessels, they're what are called lymphatic vessels, and they transfer fluid around your body, and with that fluid, a lot of immune cells. And so it's a really important part of your immune system. If you've ever experienced a blockage of lymphatic flow, say a blockage in the, the uh, arm here, you would experience a lot of swelling or edema distal to that. So uh, it's a really important system that a lot of us don't know much about. But this is what current anatomy textbooks look like. I'm working on a third edition, and lymphatic system <laughs> in the next edition of my book is going to have this in there. So these are lymphatic vessels in the central nervous system, and what they've shown now is anatomically that there are direct connections between the lymphatic flow in the central nervous system with the rest of the body. So we've got direct immune connections between nervous system and immune system, which is pretty cool. So is anatomy a dead science? No. <laughs> okay, and so uh, I mentioned that, you know, part of this, uh, part of my, my thing is always the, the real thing. Um, we always say that the body is the best teacher because it's the real thing. And I spent several years teaching at medical schools, and so some of these pictures come from teaching at medical schools. Right here uh, is a student, this is from Utah, and uh, what we find is that, you know, when they start actually looking in bodies, they don't see what they expect to see. Almost never. <laughs> Dr. Echo, where is this? <laughs> I can't find it. Or, what is this? And this was a case of, what is this? <laughs> and this was uh, actually what the student is holding is actually a blood clot. <laughs> and it's, it's, the shape here is the stomach and the esophagus. And so uh, we you know, figured out from this that, oh, this person most likely had what we call um, varicose veins in their esophagus, and they bled to death. And so we can determine kind of, you know, why did this person die and things like that, which are really kind of fun and interesting and very educational. Um, many, many years we just didn't pay attention to pathology and things like that. One of big projects that I did as part of my uh, PhD in anatomy was I actually created something called the Cadaver Autopsy Project, which I guess nowadays I would call the body donor <laughs> autopsy project because we really do nowadays like dislike calling our body donors cadavers because cadaver is kind of impersonal. And what these uh, individuals were or are are body donors. They gave their bodies for us to study. But in any event, we had, uh, I sat in on a bunch of autopsies with the hospital pathologists, and I kind of learned how the pathologist thinks, you know, when they're going through, they're trying to figure out the cause of death of the individual. And so I modeled a, um, a little autopsy notebook that looked a lot like the hospital pathologist notebook, but it was kind of pared down. Uh, before we did this project, if you asked the student or the student asked you, they said, oh, you know, what's, what's the size of the average human heart. <laughs> is there an average human heart? There's kind of expected, right? But not, not really average. <laughs> but the only answer you would get would be, it's about the size of your fist. Like, Great, that tells me a lot, right? <laughs> uh, that doesn't tell me really that much. That's the size, but does it tell me if it's diseased, if it's not diseased? What does it tell me about the heart itself? So how this changed is we would then have the students actually measure uh, the thickness of the wall of the heart and things like this and compare them to expected numbers. And so they could that, and then actually say, this is abnormal, and then think about why it might be abnormal. And maybe look for some other clues about what's going on. Uh, this is a heart, uh, we call this gross anatomy, because, not because it's disgusting, right? But because you can see it with a naked eye. And, we studied both gross anatomy and microanatomy here. So you'll see both kinds of slides. Um, and so here's an example of a uh, case study that we had. And in this heart here, 
the students, one of the first things they noticed, they said, Dr. Echo, come over here, take a look. Look what we got. There's wires in this heart, you know. <laughs> Where did that come from? And sure enough, they are connected to a pacemaker. So this is a heart that had a pacemaker. Some of the other observations, listed causes of death were diabetes, coronary artery disease, and hypertension. And some of the pathology we saw, they had bypass grafts. So uh, those are vessels that are uh, grafted onto the heart itself, uh, the pacemaker, and a large heart. We took that heart and cut it in half. And what you see here, the dark stuff, is actual regular cardiac muscle that's healthy, that is all scar tissue. So when we took a sample of that, we look at it over here, and these are cardiac muscle cells, but they're enlarged, they're hypertrophied, and there's not very many of them. What's left in here, this is all scar tissue. And scar tissue doesn't contract, it doesn't conduct electricity, it doesn't do anything for your heart. So this told us, oh, this guy had a heart attack, he had survived, and he probably had, that's probably why he had a pacemaker, and that's probably also why he eventually died. So here, just as a comparison, I mentioned they do uh, cardiac dimensions, and we've got normal here and abnormal over here. We, and for medical students, we just want them to know, is it normal or not? They don't have to exactly know why something's abnormal. But right here, if you look, this is the ventricle or pumping chamber. It's about, that was like two to three inches thick. And that is very abnormal. So this is a hugely hypertrophied heart. And uh, that means that this person probably had hypertension and their heart had to work harder in order to pump their blood. And this is something when, why you, when you go to the doctor, they measure your blood pressure because over time this will lead to uh, typically disease and you may end up with a myocardial infarction or heart attack yourself. So. This, just to give you another example, uh, this is actually a lung that's been cut open. And what we used to do is we used to just take the lungs out, we'd look at the blood vessels, we'd look at the lobes, the students would name the parts, and, they'd, and that's about all we would do. But now we're paying attention to things, and these students like, were kind of feeling the lung, and they said, there's something in there. And so we never used to cut them open, but now we have big knives in there. <laughs> so we took the lung and cut it open, and lo and behold, there's a big old tumor in there. <laughs> and so this is like, wow. <laughs> and it's kind of sad, you know, wow, that's really cool. But then you think it's not very cool for the person who had it, right? But, <laughs> but we're learning from it. <laughs> but uh, this tumor grew so fast that it became necrotic inside. And so we took a tissue sample of that. And you can see here, uh, it kind of looks just like junk. And that's because that's what it is. It's just junk. <laughs> so just an example, something we didn't do before, but we're paying attention and we're learning from actual human bodies that come from body donors. And uh, I, have, I don't have a lot of time for this, but this is uh, the hind brain here. And so we have the cerebellum and the medulla oblongata. And we took a tissue sample of this, and uh, I'll just tell you that this is very normal. But your centers for respiration and heart rate are centered there. That's where the signals go to your heart and such. And in this person over here on the right, we notice most things, most things look normal, but then you see there's some uh, dark areas in here. And when we looked at it a little bit closer up, we saw that there were blood clots in there. And in fact, this part of the brain had actually uh, been pushed out through the foramen magnum and into the vertebral canal, and that's most likely what uh, killed them. They probably had a stroke, they had uh, uh, swelling of the brain, and then that caused uh, the, the, um, the problem with uh, respiration and such. So this leads me to uh, my, what is kind of a, a, very, uh, a cause very close to home to me, and that is the whole idea of body donation. Because part of this comes from having run the body donor program in West Virginia for a couple of years. But to me, having worked with body donors in many different contexts for many different years, I have come to respect these people more than anybody I know who's living. <laughs> I've actually met some people that are donors um, when they came in to sign up for this. And they are the nicest people. Uh, they, they think, well, you know, they're the kind of people that give when they're alive, and then when they're thinking about, I'm getting older, this sort of thing, maybe I want to, what else could I give after I'm gone? And they say, well, me, right? <laughs> and just so you know, if you're an organ donor, you're not a whole body donor. So they're separate things. And so what we do when we work with these donors is, and particularly when we have them in the classroom, 
We teach our students the utmost to treat these people with the utmost of respect. We run clean labs. We don't allow jokes, those sorts of things. And then we actually, uh, most medical schools nowadays are doing memorial services. And this is a picture here from a memorial service a couple of years ago in West Virginia. And uh, you see medical students sitting behind the stage, and they do a non-denominational service. And sitting on the other side are all the family members of the donor. And so we have the medical students, and we have the family members. And uh, the, and the best part about this, at the very end of the service, uh, it is kind of an open mic session, and so students will say, "Oh my gosh, all this stuff that I learned." And um, to me, the most one of the most power, powerful things that seems to happen every year is someone stands up and they say, "You know, my mom decided to do this to donate her body. I completely disagreed with her decision, and I'm so impressed now with the way that her body was treated, and I'm so proud of her for giving her body so that others might learn and they might come and be able to save." me someday, uh, that I might even be a body donor myself. So if you're wondering about this, in Montana, our body donation program is at Montana State University. So thank you very much.